We live in a strange time, yet those in control seem unable to deal with them. No one has any vision of a different or a better kind of future. It is about how over the past 40 years, politicians, financiers and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead, they constructed a simpler version of the world in order to hang on to power. And as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. What happened that day in New York marked a radical shift in power. This was a new kind of politics. The old politicians believed that crises were solved through negotiations and deals. The bankers had a completely different view. They were just the representatives of something that couldn't be negotiated with. The logic of the market. To them, there was no alternative to this system. It should run society. By the middle of the 1980s, the banks were rising up and becoming ever more powerful in America. What had started ten years before in New York, the idea that the financial system could run society, was spreading. But unlike older systems of power, it was mostly invisible. In the growing power of finance. How the companies that ran the new systems of credit knew more and more about you, and increasingly Use that information to control your destiny. And the system that was allowing this to happen were the new giant networks of information connected through computer servers. Of a new and growing power that was way beyond politics. But something was about to happen that would demonstrate dramatically just how far the American government had detached from reality. The Soviet Empire was about to implode. And no one, none of the politicians, or the journalists, or the think tank experts, or the economists, or the academics, saw it coming. The collapse of the Soviet Union also had a powerful effect on the West. For many, it symbolized the final failure of the dream that politics could be used to build a new kind of world. What was going to emerge instead 
was a new system that had nothing to do with politics. A system whose aim was not to try and change things, but rather to manage a post-political world. One of the first people to describe this dramatic change was a left-wing German political thinker called Ulrich Beck. Beck said that any politician who believed that they could take control of society and drive it forward to build a better future was now seen as dangerous. In the past, politicians might have been able to do this, but now they were faced with what he called a runaway world, where things were so complex and interconnected and modern technologies so potentially dangerous that it was impossible to predict the outcomes of anything you did the catalogue of environmental disasters proved this. Politicians would have to give up any idea of trying to change the world. Instead, their new aim would be to try and predict the dangers in the future, and then find ways to avoid those risks. Although Beck came from the political left, the world he saw coming was deeply conservative. The picture he gave was of a political class reduced to trying to steer society into a dark and frightening future, constantly peering forward and trying to see the risks coming towards them. Their only aim, to avoid those risks and keep society stable. It only lasted for a few seconds, so you're basically shocked you really didn't know what was going on at the time. Where were you in the building and where was the explosion? Oh my God! But a system that could anticipate the future and keep society stable was already being built, pieced together from all kinds of different and sometimes surprising sources, all of them outside politics. One part of it was taking shape in a tiny town in the far northwest of the United States called East Wenatchee. It was a giant computer whose job was to make the future predictable. The man building it was a banker called Larry Fink. Back in 1986, Mr. Fink's career had collapsed. He lost $100 million in a deal and had been sacked. He became determined it wouldn't happen again. Fink started a company called BlackRock and built a computer he called Aladdin. It is housed in a series of large sheds in the apple orchards outside Wenatchee. Fink's aim was to use the computer to predict with certainty what the risk of any deal or investment was going to be. The computer constantly monitors the world and it takes things that it sees happening and then compares them to events in the past. It can do this because it has in its memory a vast history of the past 50 years. Not just financial, but all kinds of events. Out of the millions and millions of correlations, the computer then spots possible disasters, possible dangers lying in the future, and moves the investments to avoid any radical change and keep the system stable. Today I'm going to deliver 1.8 million reports. Execute 25,000 trades and avert 3,000 disasters. I'm going to monitor interest rates in Europe. Silver prices in Asia. Droughts in the Midwest. I'm going to witness 4 billion shares change hands on the New York Stock Exchange. And record the effects on 14 trillion in assets across 20,000 portfolios. I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin. And today, I'll find the numbers behind the numbers. I will see the trends the models don't. The connections. The risks. I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin, and I will get the data right. I am 25 million lines of code. Written by hundreds of people. Across two decades. I'm smarter than any algorithm. More powerful than any processor. Because I am Aladdin. Because I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin. Aladdin has proved to be incredibly successful. The assets it guides and controls 
now amount to $15 trillion, which is 7% of the world's total wealth. Back in the 1960s, there had been optimistic dreams that it would be possible to develop computers that could think like human beings. Scientists then spent years trying to program the rules that governed human thought. But they never worked. One computer scientist at MIT became so disillusioned that he decided to build a computer program that would parody these hopeless attempts. He was called Joseph Weizenbaum, and he built what he claimed was a computer psychotherapist. Just like a therapist, people could come and talk to the machine by typing in their problems. Weizenbaum called the program Eliza. He modeled it on a real psychotherapist called Carl Rogers, who was famous for simply repeating back to the patient what they had just said. That is what Eliza did. The patient sat in front of the screen and typed in what they were feeling. And the program repeated it back to them, often in the form of a question. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says um, I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear that you're depressed. One of the first people to use Eliza was Weizenbaum's secretary. And her reaction was something that he had not predicted at all. And I asked her to my office and sat her down at the keyboard. And then she began to type. And of course, I looked over her shoulder to make sure that everything was operating properly. After two or three interchanges with the, with the machine, she turned to me and she said, would you mind leaving the room, please? Weizenbaum was astonished. He discovered that everyone who tried Eliza became engrossed. They would sit for hours telling the machine about their inner feelings and incredibly intimate details of their lives. They also liked it because it was free of any kind of patronizing elitism. One person said, after all, the computer doesn't burn out, look down on you, or try to have sex with you. What Eliza showed was that in an age of individualism, what made people feel secure was having themselves reflected back to them, just like in a mirror. Artificial intelligence changed direction and started to create new systems that did just that, but on a giant scale. They were called intelligent agents. They worked by monitoring individuals, gathering vast amounts of data about their past behavior, and then looked for patterns and correlations from which they could predict what they would want in the future. It was a system that ordered the world in a way that was centred around you. And in an age of anxious individualism, frightened of the future, that was reassuring, just like Eliza. A safe bubble that protected you from the complexities of the world outside. And the applications of this new direction proved fruitful and profitable. If you liked that, you'll love this. What was rising up in different ways was a new system that promised to keep the world stable. Its tentacles reached into every area of our lives. Finance promised that it could control the unpredictability of the free market while individuals were more and more monitored to stabilize their physical and mental states. And increasingly, the intelligent agents online predicted what people would want in the future and how they would behave. But the biggest change was to politics. In a world where the overriding aim was now stability, politics became just part of a wider system 
of managing the world. The old idea of democratic politics, that it gave a voice to the weak against the powerful, was eroded. And a resentment began to quietly grow out on the edges of society. And everyone became possessed by dark forebodings, imagining the very worst that might happen. By now, cyberspace had become even more sophisticated and responsive to human interaction. The online world was full of algorithms that could analyse and predict human behaviour. The man behind much of this was a scientist called Judea Pearl. He was the godfather of modern artificial intelligence. Pearl's breakthrough had been to use what were called Bayesian belief networks. They were systems that could predict behaviour even when the information was incomplete. But to make the system work, Pearl and others had imported a model of human beings drawn from economics. They created what were called rational agents, software that mimicked human beings, but in a very simplified form. The model assumed that the agent would always act rationally in order to get what it wanted, nothing more. One of the early utopians of cyberspace, Jaron Lanier, warned of the implications of this. The agent's model of what you are interested in will always be a cartoon model. And in return, you will see a cartoon version of the world through the agent's eyes. New technology began to allow people to upload millions of images and videos into cyberspace. And the web, which up to that point had seemed like an abstract other world, began to look and feel like the real world. From videos of animals, personal moments of experience, extraordinary events, to horrific terror videos, more and more was uploaded. And in a strange, sad twist, the first terrorist beheading video that was posted online was that of Judea Pearl's own son, Daniel Pearl. This was a new world that the old systems of power found it very difficult to deal with. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the security agencies secretly collected data from millions of people online. One program was called Optic Nerve. It took stills from the webcam conversations of millions of people across the world, trying to spot terrorists planning another attack. The program did not discover a single terrorist, but it did discover something else. But increasingly, people were using the internet in other ways, to present themselves as they wanted to be seen. I guess a video blog is about me. you could like, stalk me. The web drew people in because it was mesmerizing. 
It was somewhere that you could explore and get lost in, in any way you wanted. But behind the screen, like in a two-way mirror, the simplified agents were watching and predicting and guiding your hand on the mouse. As the intelligence systems online gathered ever more data, new forms of guidance began to emerge. Social media created filters, complex algorithms that looked at what individuals liked and then fed more of the same back to them. In the process, individuals began to move, without noticing, into bubbles that isolated them from enormous amounts of other information. They only heard and saw what they liked. And the news feeds increasingly excluded anything that might challenge people's pre-existing beliefs. The version of cyberspace that was rising up seemed to be very much like William Gibson's original vision. But behind the superficial freedoms of the web were a few giant corporations with opaque systems that controlled what people saw and shaped what they thought. And what was even more mysterious was how they made their decisions about what you should like and what should be hidden from you. But then, the other utopian vision of cyberspace re-emerged. After the financial crash of 2008, the politicians saved the banks but they did practically nothing about the massive corruption that was revealed in its wake. And the reason they gave was that it might destabilize the system. Public anger burst out. The Occupy movement took over Wall Street and then the Senate in Washington. All the meetings used the idea of the human microphone. People throughout the crowd repeated a speaker's words so everyone could hear them. But if someone wanted to challenge the speaker, the human amplifiers also had to repeat their words. So their voice had equal power. What she said, what she said, was that, was that, the proposal. Each person was an autonomous individual who expressed what they believed. But together, they became components in a network that organized itself through the feedback of information around the system. You could organize people without the exercise of power. Treat. Then, almost immediately, the Arab Spring began. It seemed like a spontaneous uprising, but the internet had played a key role in organizing the groups. One of the main activists was an Egyptian computer engineer called Wahil Gonin. He worked for Google in Egypt, but he had also set up the Facebook site that played the key role in organizing the first protests. As hundreds of thousands took over Tahir Square, Gonim gave an interview on Egyptian TV. إن الشباب دول نزلوا بعشرات الألاف يوم الخمسة وعشرين فأرجوكم يا جماعة ما فيش أبطال الأبطال هم الناس اللي في الشارع الأبطال هو كل واحد فينا ما فيش واحد ما فيش النهاردة واحد ركب الحصان هو اللي بيضرب السرج ويحرك الناس إيه واحد يضحك عليكم ويقول لكم كده دي صورة شباب الإنترنت دي صورة شباب الإنترنت اللي بقت بعد كده صورة شباب مصر اللي بعد كده بقت صورة كل مصر But Gonim was also overwhelmed by the power this new technology had that a computer engineer with a keyboard could call out thousands of people, some of whom then died in the midst of the protests. I <laughs> 
بتاخد كل واحد كم ماسك في الصوت وقوم تبت فيها عايز امشي The Occupy camps had become trapped in endless meetings and it became clear that there was a terrible confusion at the heart of the movement. The radicals had believed that if they could create a new way of organizing people, then a new society would emerge. But what they did not have was a picture of what that society would be like, a vision of the future. And those who had started the revolution in Egypt came face to face with the same terrible fact. Social media had helped to bring people together in Tahir Square. But once there, the internet gave no clue as to what kind of new society they could create in Egypt. The movement stalled. And a group that did have a powerful idea, the Muslim Brotherhood, rushed in to fill the vacuum. The liberals and the left were shocked. And bit by bit, they turned back to the military, protesting asking them to save the revolution from being captured by Islamists. In the spring of 2013, the military took action. They arrested the president and killed hundreds of his supporters who protested. And an extraordinary spectacle unfolded in Tahir Square. Thousands of the liberal activists who had begun the revolution two years before, summoned by social media, now welcomed the military back by waving their laser pens at the helicopters flying overhead. The crowd had been summoned there, once again, by Facebook. After the failure of the revolutions, it was not just the radicals. No one in the West had any idea of how to change the world. At home, the politicians had given so much of their power away to finance and the ever-growing managerial bureaucracies that they, in effect, had become managers themselves. While abroad, all their adventures had failed and their simplistic vision of the world had been exposed as dangerous and destructive. And then, the same thing seemed to start happening in the West. By now, it was becoming ever more clear that the system had deep flaws. Every month, there were new revelations of most of the bank's involvement in global corruption, of massive tax avoidance by all the major corporations, of the secret surveillance of everyone's emails by the National Security Agency. Yet no one was prosecuted, except for a few people at the lowest levels. And behind it all, the massive inequality kept on growing the structure of power remained the same. Nothing ever changed, because nothing could be allowed to destabilize the system. But then, the shape-shifting began. Thank you very much. So nice. So amazing. So amazing. What? That's OK. We, I love you more, OK? The campaign that Donald Trump ran was unlike anything before in politics. Nothing was fixed. What he said, who he attacked, and how he attacked them was constantly changing and shifting. The Liberals were outraged by Trump, but they expressed their anger in cyberspace, so it had no effect, because the algorithms made sure that they only spoke to people who already agreed with them. Instead, ironically, their waves of angry messages and tweets benefited the large corporations who ran the social media platforms. One online analyst put it simply, angry people click more. It meant that the radical fury that came like waves across the internet no longer had the power to change the world. Instead, it was becoming a fuel was feeding the new systems of power and making them ever more powerful. <laughs>